Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to um, welcome you this afternoon to the final panel of this conference on the critical tasks of the university. And our two um, speakers um, this afternoon are um, Ashil Mbembe and, um, um, and Nevedita Menon. However, uh, Nevedita Menon was unable to um, uh, receive her visa in time to travel. And I'm very sorry to announce that she is not here with us today. We also tried um, valiantly to connect um, by Skype, and that also seemed not to work, um, some incompatibility between machines. So um, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to read a, a shorter version of her paper. Um, and uh, I hope that goes well. There's some words I don't know how to pronounce, and you will forgive me in advance. As you may know, um, uh, Nevedita Menon is um, a professor of politics um, and um, comparative politics and political thought at Nehru University. And she is the author of several books in feminist and political theory, including Power and Contestation, India Since 1989, uh, Seeing, like a Seeing Like a Feminist, Recovering Subversion, Gender and Politics um, uh, uh, in India. Um, and she has been, um, as many of you know, um, an extraordinarily um, uh, strong thinker who has helped to establish feminist studies in India and uh, who has, in recent years, uh, spoken up about topics that are quite controversial. The um, the claims of Kashmir to political autonomy, um, the critique of um, uh, Hindu nationalism. Um, she has also called for secular provisions in the state government, and she has been threatened with arrest and has been on several occasions since censored when she has attempted to speak with uh, student groups on campus. Um, in any case, um, I'm very sorry she's not here, especially because uh, she introduces into our discussion something we've not been able to address so far, which is censorship and the um, state police and administrative powers that decide what, what can be taught and what can be said on campus. Uh, her, her paper is entitled The University as Utopia, Critical Thinking and the Work of Social Transformation. And you will be able to read along with me. I will go relatively quickly for the purposes of time and because I trust you can see the screen. <clears throat> the Indian University in the late 20th to early 21st centuries. Universities across India have been at the forefront of militant resistance to the Hindutva project ever since the current regime under Narendra Modi came to power in 2014. Hindutva, or Hindu cultural nationalism, is a century-old project at the heart of which is the organization <clears throat> Rashtriya, and I, there I'm not going to be able to say it well, Sang, we're going to just call it Sang, which translates anodynely into national volunteer force, but its initials, RSS, bear the charge of a form of fascism that has come to be called Sangvaad, or Sangism, in India. In the words of V.D. Savarkar, Hindutva's main progenitor, it is the project to Hinduize the nation and militarize Hinduism. On the face of it, this is a nationalist rather than a religious or theocratic characterization, 
for Savarkar defines as Hindu all those who live in the land where the river Sindhu, Indus, flows. But the definition of the nation is inextricably fused with the religious identity of Hindu because only those whose sacred land, Punyabhu, is in the territory of India can be legitimately Indian. This brings into the fold Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and Sikhs, but irrevocably excludes Muslims and Christians whose originary places of worship lie elsewhere. Central to the project is the idea of samrasta, or homogeneity, that basically seeks to unite all Hindus, especially Dalits and other lower castes under North Indian Hindu upper caste hegemony. This is the ideology of the formation that now rules India. How do universities figure in this project? An ideologue of contemporary Hindutva wrote recently, those who considered the RSS the enemy of secularism and nationalism no longer hold state power. However, they still hold the dominant position in academia, end quote. This is the simple reason why universities have been the target of relentless attack from this regime. Somehow, despite all the legitimate critique mounted on our university system across the board, especially from so-called left secular perspectives, we have managed over the decades to build university spaces that are richly diverse as well as nerve centers of critical thinking. Sinha calls for decolonizing the Indian mind, but his understanding of decolonization is a simplistic counterposition of West India, in which left and secular both count as emanating from the West, and Hindutva is the only legitimate Indian perspective. This is a characteristic Hindutvavadi position which dehistoricizes India into a Hindu formation extending back over millennia and homogenizes the West while continuously driven by an anxiety to be recognized and validated by this very West. Hindutva, however, is only one of the planks of the current regime run by the Bar Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, a party that owes allegiance to the RSS. Its other plank is a vigorously pro-corporate and neoliberal project. However, this project was not inaugurated by the BJP in 2014. It was the previous regime, headed by the Indian National Congress, that began the process of structural adjustment in the 1990s. Later, between 2004 and 2014, the Congress-led United Progressive Alliance, which for some years was supported by left parties and social movements, continued this process. Universities were beginning to be restructured along neoliberal lines to produce cheap educated labor for the global economy. On that front, the BJP government is only taking forward the UPA agenda more single-mindedly than the UPA could, however, because the latter was hobbled by the democratic pressures of the alliance it was in. The BJP has absolute majority in parliament, and there is nothing to constrain it. The UPA, however, was still in the Nehruvian secular mode. At worst, sections of it could be characterized as soft Hindutva. Its attitude to dissent, too, was largely relaxed, and universities remained spaces of vibrant protest. Students had been at the forefront of protests across the country, especially in the inaugural years of the 21st century, against issues as varied as land acquisition and large-scale displacement by relentlessly neoliberal regimes, corruption, sexual harassment, gender discrimination, homophobic politics, cutbacks in education budgets, anti-worker policies, and rampant caste-based discrimination. Radical critics had characterized this as permitting a harmless venting of anger while the regime continued on its path. However, the current regime's crackdown and intolerance of the slightest dissent suggests that this emergence of universities as spaces of militant resistance may not have been so harmless after all. 
Since 2014, these protests have been specifically against Hindutva politics, violent moves to control the food and dietary habits of large numbers of communities, moral policing of young people, and communal violence set coldly and calculatedly in motion by what Paul Brass has called institutionalized systems of riot production. These protests have been militant but utterly nonviolent, and they have been relentless. These are not elite young people as they are often portrayed in the media thanks to the continued expansion of education, reservation policies, and in universities like Nehru University. Affirmative action through deprivation points, the class, caste, and gender profile of these young people is remarkably heterogeneous. Like Rohit Vimula of University of Hyderabad, whose charismatic leadership on the basis of a left-inflected uh, Ambedkarite um, uh, political vision and powerful suicide letter galvanized the country. Kanhaya Kumar, the arrested JNU student union pro president, jailed for sedition, or Richa Singh, first woman president of Allahabad University Students' Union, battling the entrenched patriarchy of the Hindi belt campuses, most of them come from modest to extremely poor families, having battled discrimination of different sorts at every stage. When they enter public universities that still are affordable to many, offer spaces of learning, lively debate, intellectual growth and political understanding of structural injustices, a good part of it outside classrooms, something magical happens. Young people from marginalized sections see that social transformation is possible and that they can be the agents of that transformation. It is important to note here that public universities have a long history in India. Some were set up by the colonial administration to produce Indian administrators and clerks, universities of Madras, Bombay, Calcutta, for example, others by progressive rulers of princely states in British India, Mysore, Baroda, and yet others by nationalists, either aspiring to be a modern Western university or a radical alternative. After independence, the network of publicly funded universities was deepened and strengthened, a phenomenon not so common among newly independent countries. University education in India is cheaper than school education, a sector in which private institutions with high fees predominate. Nehru University was specifically set up by an act of parliament in 1969 intended to be a university that would work to promote social justice and secularism, social responsibility, the composite culture of India, scientific temper, and international understanding, and would teach students to be sensitive to the social needs of the country. Moreover, debates in parliament focused on the need to make this a university not for the children of the rich, but for the deserving. And JNU's unique deprivation point system has ensured that a diverse and heterogeneous body of students who qualify in the national entrance exam are able to find hostile accommodation and high quality education affordable to most sections of Indian society. There has been considerable work on the transformations that have been sweeping higher education in India in the last few decades. Two significant changes must be noted in the field of higher education in India. The first change visible is in size. Between 2001 and 2010, higher education more than doubled its institutions and raised enrollment by 62%. This growth, says Satish Satish Deshpande is driven from the demand side by a demographic growth of the young in the population, by expanded access to schooling, and by larger numbers being able to afford higher education. On the supply side, higher education has grown through privatization, with the private sector now accounting for a majority of both institutions and total enrollment. In addition, in 2006, the government rolled out reservations in higher education institutions for the caste category called OBC, based on the Mandal Commission report 
along with which a general expansion in education was inaugurated. The second, no less significant change is in the socioeconomic profile of those who access higher education. It used to be overwhelmingly dominated by male urban upper caste students and even more so teachers. Women now account for 42% of total enrollment and the lower castes are also increasingly increasing their share. Hindu upper caste men, who were more than two-thirds of all graduates, are now a minority among enrolled students, though still overrepresented relative to their population share. Rural and first-generation entrants have also been increasing. But what is it these students expect from their education? Deshpande addresses one of the central issues, that of quality and the puzzling phenomenon of the proliferation of institutions that do not even aspire to quality. Why, he asks, are worthless credentials not driven out of the market? Why do parents pay astronomical sums for admission of their wards into institutions known to provide little or no training? His answer is sharply insightful and troubling. Higher education credentials in India are a claim to status, not competence. The degree is required only as a legal formality or for its status connotations. Quote, the competence it claims to certify is an inessential luxury, end quote. This is why, says Deshpande, all the ex exhortations to improve quality fail in the face of the intractable problem of the quality indifferent customer whom he sees as armed with substantial purchasing power but in fact could also be the poor aspirant to education too. He concludes that this might be an inevitable phase of market and social evolution. What then is the purpose of higher education at this historical moment? Despande provides us with an answer dazzling in its simplicity. In these social contexts, Higher education may be most relevant, not for the training it is supposed to impart, but for the sheer space that it provides. Being a legitimate, if embattled space, it is able to trigger the destabilizing chain of events that, despite the inevitable tragedies along the way, will, in will ultimately bring irreversible change. It is this sweeping transformation that is sought to be curbed and controlled by the current regime, with drastic seat cuts and budget cuts for research in order to bring to a halt both expansion as well as to critical thinking while transforming the university into a skills factory for the global market. The Western University in the Global South. The second part of the paper indicates a critique that sections of intellectuals had begun articulating in a sustained way in the 1950s at least. In 1954, the Visvap Arati Quarterly, published by Tagore's University, republished a lecture delivered in 1931, 16 years before India's independence by Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, titled Swaraj in Ideas. Um, that extended the notion of Swaraj, or self-determination, to the realm of ideas. Calling cultural domination a subtler form of political domination, he nevertheless was clear that assimilation of an alien culture was not necessarily subjection, and in fact, assimilation of new and foreign ideas may be necessary for progress. Cultural subjection is when one's traditional cast of ideas and sentiments is superseded without comparison or competition by a new caste representing an alien culture which possesses one like a ghost. The Indian mind, said Bhattacharya, has subsided below the conscious level of culture for Western educated men and operates only at the level of family life and in some social and religious practices. Meanwhile, Western ideas, springing as they do from a rich and strong life, the life of the West, they induce in us a shadow mind that functions like a real mind, except in the matter of genuine creativeness. In the discipline of sociology, Shiv Viswanathan has written about scholars associated with the Lucknow School of Economics and Sociology. 
late 1950s to early 60s, who trespassed the borders of disciplines and were concerned with how Indian civilization and community responded to the nationalist project of planned development. Other scholars based in Delhi, such as Ashish Nandi, Tien Madan, and Rajni Kotari, from the 1980s onwards were at the center of intellectual attempts to understand the specificities of Indian culture and politics, bringing to bear a general critique of universal notions of modernity on concepts such as secularism and democracy in India. Such critiques remained at the margins, however, and the hegemony of a left secular Nehruvian dispensation over acad academic institutions, which saw education as the drive to foster the scientific temperament, relentlessly delegitimized as indigenist and crypto Hindutva, all attempts to question the Eurocentric canon that university and school curricula had set up. The organization of knowledge production and transmission in universities all over the global south is based on the disciplinary model developed in Western universities over the 19th and 20th century. That is to say, while the earliest institutions of higher learning are found from the 5th century CE onwards in what is now South and West Asia, the particular form that the university took in Europe in the 19th century has come to assume the form of the only legitimate model of higher education. This is or is not, of course, always the case. Knowledge flowed the other way in an earlier age. Mamkad, Mamdani, Mahmoud, I'm sorry, I can't read this well. <laughs> I know Mahmoud very well. Okay, Mahmoud Mamdani points out that the graduation gowns seen all over the modern world are derived from the Islamic madrasa of West Asia. The early universities of Europe, Oxford, Cambridge, Sorbonne, borrowed not just these gowns, but much of their curriculum from these institutions, Greek philosophy, to Iranian astronomy, to Arab medicine and Indian mathematics. They had little difficulty at that time in accepting this flowing gown modeled after the dress of the desert nomad as the symbol of high learning." End quote. In his sophisticated study on colonial education poly policy in India, Sanjay Seth centrally questions the status of modern Western knowledge quote, the assumption that it's not merely one mode of knowledge, but is knowledge as such, and that it must be adequate to its Indian object because it is adequate to all objects, end quote. Seth places colonial education policy in India within the context of the transformations wrought by modernity itself, beginning with Europe, thus revealing both Europe and us to be particular cases of a general history of modernity, as Partha Chatterjee puts it elsewhere. In Europe, too, the advent of modernity had set up for the first time the knowing subject who is set apart from, even set up against the objects to be known. The world became external to the knower. It became disenchanted. The pre-modern knowledges of Europe were just as decisively displaced by the modern knowing subject as were the pre-modern knowledges of India. Pre-modern knowledges did not presume a sharp distinction between the knower and the world she sought to show, and it was precisely this understanding that came to be seen by modern knowledge as the source and root of the errors of pre-modern knowledges. Seth points out that this was a radically new conception of knowledge, and its subject had to be created through quote, new, new pedagogic practices and through the transformations and disciplines enforced by industrialization and capitalism, modern armies, and the modern novel, end quote. A project that was met with resistance even in Europe, but in India, further refracted by the fact that it's being carried through by violent and coercive colonial rule. It should be clear that Seth's agenda is not to claim that indigenous knowledges were more authentic and that Western education was alien to India. Rather, it is to situate education and pedagogy in colonial India within the framework of a notion of modernity that has come since the 17th century to hegemonize notions of knowledge globally. One important controversy was over the failure of Western education to act as a vehicle of modernity and its simultaneous success in denationalizing its products. 
The complaint here was that Indian students had an instrumental relationship to knowledge, that they saw Western education as helping them to fulfill only their material needs and goals, that education did not transform them into proper modern individuals with modern values. The complaint that Indians are hypocritical in maintaining outward allegiance to modernity while remaining pre-modern in their selfhood is a common one among modernizing Indian elites even today, articulated within a discourse of our incomplete modernity, within quotes. A remarkably insightful response to this can be found in A.K. Ramanujan's brilliant little essay, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking?, in which he shows how, in the context sensitive, pre-modern, within quotation marks, Indian way of life, the context free, the modern, becomes simply yet another context. What is understood to be universal modernity, sweeping everything before its path, becomes in India merely one of many contexts within which people work and between which they move seamlessly. Ram, Ram, Ramanujan's theoretical innovation lies in stepping away from the field of dichotomized modernity tradition, as well as the notion of alternative modernities that leaves normative modernity unquestioned. His framework, in which context-free modernity is merely another context, is not just a unique Indian phenomenon, but has theoretical purchase globally. The computer programmer anywhere in the world observing a religious fast for Lent, Ramzan or Navratri, is an instance of Ramanujan's insight. Thus, while the hegemonic drive of modernity did colonize the imagination globally, it never quite managed to her hermetically seal all its borders. This is the insight we can take away from Ramanujan. In a parallel argument, Seth makes it clear that there was not one indigenous knowledge that confronted modern Western education, but several knowledges and practices differentiated by the intended users and the groups and castes to whom they were available and from whom they were restricted. The characteristic trait they shared, however, was what all pre-modern knowledges, Western and Indian, had in common. Unlike the rationalization associated with modernity, which freed knowledge from substantive contexts and made it, in principle, independent of its uses. In traditional learning, the content and form are indistinguishable. It is only with rationalization that increasingly, knowledges and skills that could only be learnt in the doing now presuppose a mastery of the theory that can not only be independently learnt, but the knowledge of which is superior to merely learning by practice. Seth argues that knowledges, and I quote again, are not forms of cognizing a world external to them, but rather are constitutive of this world, end quote. Modern knowledge, then, reworks the world and its past in terms comprehensible only within itself. Seth correctly points out the ethical unsustainability of this position, which characterizes our contemporaries as somehow inhabiting a past that we have left behind. From this perspective, even alternative nationalist visions of education did not escape the normalizing thrust of modern Western knowledge. That modern Western knowledge became identified with knowledge as such. It is, in Sanjay Seth's words, as much the fruit of nationalist strivings as it is of colonial imposition. Universities and school education in independent India have been set firmly within this frame, with few exceptions other knowledges as the outside of education. A significant document that attempted to challenge this idea of knowledge and education is the National Curriculum Framework from 2005. Its focus is on school education, but as a general statement about knowledge and education, it is inspiring and creative. The NCF 2005 holds that unless learners can locate their individual standpoints in relation to the context represented in textbooks and relate this knowledge to their experiences, knowledge is reduced to mere information. The point is that students bring with them their own experiences of the world around, which is rarely heeded. 
The examples the NCF cites are about local knowledges, traditions of naming and categorizing plants, or ways of harvesting and storing water, or of practicing sustainable agriculture. Sometimes these may be different from the way in which school knowledge approaches the subject, and NCF suggests that in such situations, teachers could recognize and help children develop projects of study based on the local tradition, comparing it with the school tradition. Quote, in some cases, as in the case of classifying plants, the, tr the two traditions may be simply parallel and based on different criteria considered significant. In other cases, for example, the classification and diagnosis of illnesses, it may challenge and contradict local belief systems. It is also possible to consider that there are cases where the local belief system seems more ecologically valid than the textbook opinion, end quote. Now, the knowledges and traditions students bring with them are, of course, not simply power-neutral knowledges. The NCF 2005 addresses it directly and says, quoting again, community-based identities of gender, caste, class, and religion are primary identities, but they can also be oppressive and reaffirm social inequalities and hierarchies. Social school, rather school knowledge, can also provide a lens through which children can develop a critical understanding of their social reality. It could also provide them space to talk about their experiences and anxieties within their homes. An earlier left secular model of education in India assumed that such beliefs can simply be eradicated. But NCF 2005 takes the more difficult path. Quote, communities may also have questions about the inclusion or exclusion of particular knowledge and experiences in the school curriculum. The school must then be prepared to listen to their concerns and to persuade them to see the educational value of such decisions. In other words, NCF 2005 believes the, the, proce the process of social transformation to be complex and multi-layered, involving the student not only in the classroom, but as located in her family and community. Most importantly, this process is understood to be uncompromisingly bound within democratic procedures, listening, persuading, mutually learning. The prejudice and power of the teacher, of course, is central and inadequately confronted. Across Indian universities today, and most powerfully in my university, JNU, I can hear the censors coming, um, students from historically marginalized communities have been foregrounding the viva voce section of admissions to research programs as the, as the space in which class and caste prejudice play out most explicitly. It is held that the predominantly Savama upper caste and privileged fac faculty use this section to exclude students from marginalized caste and class positions. While the written exam is anonymous, identified by a roll number alone, the VIVA exposes caste and class markers as well as inability to be articulate in spoken English and enables large-scale exclusion of undesirable students, it is believed. The question of power and prejudice acquires an altogether different dimension when we consider the Southern University. <clears throat> If our struggle is to recover knowledges buried by history, to subvert existing knowledge formations, and to generate new knowledges out of local histories and practices, then we cannot be training ourselves merely to enter existing fields of settled knowledges that have emerged from the history and location of the global north. Here it is instructive to consider critically a text generally accepted to be an illustration of radical pedagogy, the ignorant schoolmaster, 1987 by French philosopher Jacques Rancière, from which, which from the perspective of the global south seems curiously innocent about the drive of assimilative power. Settled and unsettling knowledges. In this text, Rancière writes about Joseph Jagoteau, a school teacher driven into exile during the period of monarchical restoration in France in the early 19th century, who developed a method of showing illiterate parents how they could themselves teach their children to read. Landing up with a job in a Flemish-speaking part of Belgium, he had to teach children who spoke no French while he spoke no Flemish. 
He tried an experiment with a recently published bilingual edition of Homer in French and Flemish. He asked his students through an interpreter to learn on their own the French text with the help of the Flemish translation. After some time, he asked them to write about the text in French, and he was astonished to find they could do so as well as French students would have done. He had not taught them the first elements of French, neither spelling nor grammar. The students had looked for the French words that corresponded to words they knew in Flemish and figured out the grammar by themselves. Jacques Auteau's experience shows us, says Ranciere, that the pedagogical problem is, quote, to reveal an intelligence to itself. Anything can be used, a song, a prayer that the student knows by heart. There is always something the student knows that can be used as a point of comparison. The master's two fundamental tasks then are interrogation, he demands speech, the manifestation of an intelligence that was not aware of itself, and verification that the work is done with attention. To do this, a highly skilled master is not required and is even a liability because his knowledge discreetly leads the students to the right answer rather than allowing their own intelligence to do the work. In this method, called universal teaching, equality is not a goal to be attained but assumed as a starting point. Anyone is capable of grasping the most difficult of ideas since the same intelligence is at work in all human endeavor. Now, while this is the kind of radical pedagogy of which we can immediately see the progressive potential, it seems to me that it addresses only one kind of knowledge and one kind of learning. That is, its radicalism lies in using one's own intelligence rather than that of a teacher to enter into an existing body of knowledge with its own established rules, to learn how to do X. But what if one thinks of knowledges as having to be subverted of existing knowledges as embodying dominant discourses of power, of knowledges as constituting subjects of governmentality in, Foucauldians, in Foucauldian terms? Then the point would not be to learn the rules well, but to subvert them to constitute new bodies of knowledge and counter selves. For instance, Ranciere does not consider the politics of the gradual marginalization of Flemish by the French nation state in the making so that it would always be Flemish speakers having to learn French rather than vice versa. He does not consider the ways in which modernity in general introduced standardized forms of organizing time and space, maps, calendars that did considerable violence to the peasant knowledges it was still replacing in Jacques Auteau's time. Thus, Ranciere says that the locksmith who does not know the alphabet can look at a calendar. Doesn't he know the order of the months? And can't he thus figure out January, February, March? He knows that February has only 28 days. He sees that one column is shorter than the others, and he will recognize 28. However, the Gregorian calendar that Ranciere takes for granted has nothing to do with the natural cycles by which peasants live, and illiterate people have to learn to read the calendar as much as they have to learn the alphabet. It is not a knowledge that is inborn or naturally imbibed in all worlds and contexts, even in the 20th century. This way of learning appears then to be about learning to enter and negotiate existing formations of knowledge. From the perspective of the global south, such education would then amount to learning to negotiate worlds of already produced knowledge emanating from the powerful parts of the, of the world. It would amount to learning how to do X, where X remains uninterrogated and its status as knowledge unquestioned. It's useful here to consider an argument made by Peter Winch who, writing about the relationship between language and reality, makes a distinction between two kinds of languages. One is a set of linguistic conventions, such as English, French, and so on. When one knows one language and wants to learn another, one remains within the same world, learning English names for the objects and experiences one already knows in French. Thus, when one learns to command, say, in English, to say, do this, one is not learning to command per se, but the differences between the language of science modernity and those of the other world views, he uses the example of magic practices of an African tribe called the Azanda, are not of this order. When one learns mathematics, say, or science, one learns a whole worldview, a set of beliefs of which the language is only an expression. 
learning to prove something mathematically is not simply learning a new way of expressing something I already know in another language. I am learning a new action that can only be performed in that language. Cool point. Okay, sorry. For instance, debates over secularism in India stumble in the first instance over its translation into Hindi. Both its translations, one as Sarv Dharma Samabhava, which means the state must treat all religions equally, and the other as Dharma Nirpekshata, which means that the state must maintain equal distance from all religions, really express another relationship between state and religion, very different from European notions of church-state separation. However, for decades, these two phrases were seen as simply translating the English concept in some deficient way, although they are closer to traditions in the Indian subcontinent, where multiple religious and cultural communities have coexisted, whether affably or by deftly managing conflict over centuries. In the Indian subcontinent, no philosophical tradition, whether Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic, or Sikh, has seen the state as separate from religion. And yet, the state and religion were never fused, as in medieval Christianity. Recognizing these difficulties, the framers of the Indian constitution decided not to use the term secularism at all. It was inserted 26 years later through a constitutional amendment. In political discourse, however, secularism became quite a central category and assumed a self-evident and already accomplished state of being, when in fact the task was to learn an entire universe of doing. The complicated ways in which left parties and movements in, in India have had to negotiate religious and cultural practices for a long time seen as necessarily regressive and the new formulations of what secularism can be in the face of the Hindutva onslaught are indications of the enormity of the task before us regarding knowledges old, new, and reconstructed, and the radically different universes languages can give birth to. The, re the reason Jacotot's method requires no teacher or the ignorant teacher, the ignorant schoolmaster, I think is the uh, name it in the translation, is that education is seen as learning to do in a new language what you already know in another. You don't see beyond or question the world you are given. You learn to negotiate it. The calendar can teach you numbers and the alphabet only if you are already immersed in a world marked by these things. Ranciere thus fails to question how some knowledges attain the status of knowledge while other knowledges are to be discarded. Scholar activist Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, there we mentioned it twice now, to, offers a different view of knowledge and learning than presented by Ranciere. In Problem Posing Education, as he calls it, no one teaches another, but nor is anyone self-taught. Through dialogue, the teacher of students and the students of the teacher cease to exist, and the teacher, student, and students, teachers emerge they become jointly responsible for a process in which they all grow. Thus, this model, too, gives up on the idea of the all-knowing teacher, but not on the idea of a teacher altogether. It seems to me that the teacher, in this understanding, is the entry of the outside into one's world, destabilizing its codes of meaning, common sense, and order. In this sense, the students are the outside of the teacher's world, and she of theirs. The teacher knows 10 things her students do not know, but they know 10 things she doesn't, as Freire finds when he plays a game with the peasants group he is visiting, in which they ask him 10 questions. What's soil liming? What's green fertilizer? And he asks them 10. What's an intransitive verb? What's epistemology? In problem-posing education, everybody is a student teacher. People are in the process of becoming unfinished beings in and with a likewise unfinished reality, thus necessitating that education be an ongoing activity, an activity that asks us to consider reality critically. Subversion and new knowledges. The NCF 2005 took a brave leap into rethinking knowledge and education along these lines, but most syllabi in Indian universities assume the universality of theory, 
simply applying that theory to local specificities and finding large parts of the lacking in the proper development of modern qualities such as democracy, economic development, secularism, individualism, and so on. However, in different ways and in different places from Manipal in southern India to Kampala in Uganda, attempts are being made over the early decades of the 21st century, century to genuinely provincialize Europe and to destabilize what Sudipta Kaviraj has termed Euro-normality, asserting location as the starting point of knowledge and theorizing, drawing on intellectual traditions of the global south, making their concepts the points of reference. As Mahmoud Mamdani puts it, the universalization of particular modes of thought goes alongside the particularization of other modes of thought. The centuries between the conquest of the Americas and the decolonization movement signified by Bandung witnessed two related movements in the history of thought. On the one hand, Eurocentric thought was elevated to a universal. On the other, non-European modes of thought were containerized as so many traditions of no more than local significance. An assessment of the intellectual legacy of this period calls for a double task alongside a critique of Eurocentrism, an exploration of engagements across various non-European modes of thought bounded as so many discrete traditions. The idea of applying theory produced in one context to understand practice in another assumes that political practice is non-theoretical, completely bereft of any discursive theoretical content so that any theory from the West can be used to make sense of political practice anywhere. But, quoting again, all political practice is always constituted by some form of reflection and thought theoretical or non-theoretical, and as we realize painfully today, at least one part of theorization must be about making sense of practice through an understanding of the subject's own world and her categories of thought." End quote. What follows, therefore, indicates some forms that the project of actually decolonizing knowledge has taken in the Indian Academy, not in the glib, derivative, Hindutvavadi way, but through attempts to rigorously traverse fields of knowledge in the global south, while opening up both Western and Indian knowledge to interrogation. And I think I'm, I'm going to end in a few minutes here, because I'm a little worried that I have the longer version rather than the shorter. I don't know if anybody knows for sure. Um, I, I have no way to, to see. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what follows, therefore, indicates, um, uh, okay, not the glib. We find over the last two decades, in particular, imaginative and creative ways in which individual courses or entire syllabi have been designed or reworked in different parts of India, in universities, as well as in non-university teaching spaces, such as courses offered by publicly funded research institutions. Okay. so. I see that this goes on for some time, and I'm going to um, uh, I'm, go I'm going to al allow us to end here, even though um, I do think um, it's quite important uh, the particular um, example she gives us. But I oh, it does say shorter. Okay. Um, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna. I'm going to end with her final paragraph. Um, um, as you can see, um, um, she's citing Banerjee, who claims that the work of theory before us is that of contemporanizing and reassembling. Contemporanizing involves, in their view, a change in the very understanding of what thought traditions are. It involves treating diverse intellectual traditions as lived traditions whose style and substance reverberate in the present, structuring the way people live and make sense of the world. Uh, Ambedkar, in this understanding, not only recovered Buddhism, but contemporanized it. As we do theory in unfamiliar ways, and that theory undoes us, something, th something happens too, and in universities, those bureaucratic entities whose job is to produce well-schooled individuals for the world as it is. 
to spite themselves, the explosive combination of youth, its disrespect for conventions, and the challenges that access to knowledge produces generate moments of utopia, moments that dismantle settled knowledge and set up unprecedented conversations that permit the outside to enter and transform them, and that enter the outside to transform it so that education somehow spills out of its respectable limits and becomes a relentless act of social transformation. Great. Uh, I'm enormously pleased to introduce Ashil Mbembe, um, uh, someone from whom I've learned enormously over the years. Um, most people know Ashil Mbembe um, uh, from his work on the post-colony, um, uh, but also his extraordinary work on necropolitics, and um, most recently um, his work, which has been translated as uh, the critique of black reason. Um, uh, he is one of the most um, illustrious, challenging, and um, erudite intellectuals of our time, and I think I'll just let him carry on. First of all, uh, I would like to thank Judith and Rosie and Raffaele and his team for, for bringing us all, all here around uh, as we have seen over the last two days, a very important uh, topic. Um, I spent my life running away from the tropics, only for the tropics to catch up with us here. And uh, <laughs> if I don't fall asleep before you, uh, uh, I hope you will stay awake. It's very hot here. Um, I would like to share two sets of broad comments on uh, this uh, uh, question of uh, uh, the critical tasks of the university now. I would like to make a first set of comments around the question of institutions. Because after all, a university is many, many things, but it's fundamentally an institution. So the first set of comments will have to do with this question of institutions. And the second will deal with the question of knowledge since what sets apart the university, what makes it different from other institutions, at least we, we still hope, is the fact that it is a knowledge institution. So over uh, the last two days, I think our discussions have shown at least two things in relation to these two issues of knowledge and institutions. The first thing I take from the discussions we have had is the belief many of us still hold onto or still cling to the idea that what sets the university apart from other institutions, what makes it such that is not just a corporation, or is not just a parastatal, as we know of many in the part of the world we come from, what sets it apart from other social and human institutions is the belief that this is an institution where knowledge is produced, but knowledge that will hopefully set us free. Knowledge which will help us live a different existence in common. It seems to me that, to come back to 
the discussions we were having the first day, if there is anything to defend, this is what it is. And this is what sets the university apart from any other human institution. And this is the reason why the university should be the last institution to close its door. Because when it closes, that's it for the project of freedom and the project of some kind of different existence in common. So that's the first thing I draw from the uh, reflections we have been sharing over the last two days. So indeed, there is something to defend. How we defend it is probably part of what we should be debating. The second remark is that this belief, which I have just articulated, which is at the same time a hope, both are currently under serious pressure. They are under serious pressure because, as we have been, uh, many speakers uh, told us, because worldwide, not only in the north, not only in the south, but almost everywhere, not only the university as an institution, but also the disciplines which constitute the foundations of modern knowledge, all of that is facing a set of old and unprecedented challenges, many of which stem from various interrelated and mostly contradictory processes, claims or even demands. Yesterday, Sarah, I think, Premesh could have said the same thing. In South Africa, for instance, there have been a huge pressure over the last few years to insource cleaners and subaltern workers in the university. This has been done in a number of institutions, including at Wits University, where we work. I don't have the exact figures in mind, but the insourcing process has cost above 100 million rands. These are not rich institutions. This means these 100 million rands won't be spent on updating the library. They won't be spent on subscribing to new journals unless money is found somewhere else, which precisely shows the extent to which, as Sarah was saying yesterday, justice, which is absolutely necessary, has a cost. Question, therefore, is, how is who, who carries the cost of justice, and how do we make sure that the cost of justice is more or less equally shared? So that's one example of the contradictory demands that are being put on this institution in places such as uh, South Africa. But of all these contradictory processes, it seems to me two in particular urgently demand our attention, our care, or at the least our curiosity. The first is that more than ever before, the university cannot claim to be the only knowledge institution. I don't know whether there was a time in history when the university made such a claim, but if it did, such a claim is more and more fictitious. Higher learning and research are more and more dispersed or redistributed among various arrays of institutions, which means that somewhat we are entering an era of demonopolization, if it ever existed, demonopolization 
of the functions of higher learning and research. So to this demonopolization of knowledge functions, one has to add the increasing inability of traditional knowledge institutions to respond effectively to unfolding political contestations as well as new learning environments and publics. That the publics of the university, somebody used the term stakeholders yesterday. I don't want to go there. Let's just stick with the idea of publics. The publics of the university are much more complex today than they ever were before. It's not simply students, it's not simply staff, it's not simply management, it's not simply alumni, it's Mellon Foundation, uh, uh, and, 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 and. And yet, were we to look carefully around us, we would certainly be struck by the uh, simultaneous emergence of new bodies of thought involved in rethinking all kinds of things. If you want, what strikes me right now is not simply the crisis narrative, which we are being accustomed to, especially coming from the humanities. It's also the incredible experimentation going on of which we do not talk that much about. All kinds of rethinking of the nature of knowledge itself, the nature of being, the nature of matter, the formation of uh, what some have called new knowledge assemblages, not exactly the old disciplines, this too is part of the picture, it seems to me. So this leads me to argue that including in the humanities, which have been the main focus of our diagnosis uh, during this conference, these are not only times of crisis, these are also times of heightened curiosity and accompanying experimentation. And look at the number of journals Almost every two months, you have a new journal on one or the other thing. Of course, this testifies somewhat to the fragmentation of the disciplines, but it's also a testimony to the kind of uh, experimentation we, we are talking about. So that's the first set of comments I, I wanted to share, and they will be very light comments because I mean, with the oppressive <laughs> heat in this room, uh, I can't go into, into sophisticated uh, uh, or close reading stuff. So that's the first set of comments. Now I move to the second set of comments. There have been, uh, throughout the last two days, many references to neoliberalism, and certainly for very good reasons. Very good reasons because it is true, wherever we look, it is true that a global rescaling of the university is underway. It didn't start yesterday. Those of you who are familiar with uh, the, uh, the US case may, in fact, agree with me that in the US, for instance, the rescaling of the university started at least during the second half of the 20th century. So we can, in fact, say that that is rescaling of the university, which started in the middle of the 20th century in America, is now reaching its final stage globally. In any case, that's a hypothesis I would like to put forward. It is a rescaling which is 
spearheaded by many different factors, the most important of which are, of course, global markets. Notably, speculation-driven finance. That is the case. The case is also that if we are to believe people who have studied these processes, political economists, economists who have spent time documenting and studying, analyzing these processes, it is also true that there is a new orthodoxy that has emerged in relation to what a university should be. The new orthodoxy has it that universities are a burden. It wasn't always like that. There was a time when universities were a resource, when they were absolutely important, not only for the business of nation building, as in post-colonial Africa, the building of new states, but also as pillars of the project of liberal democracy. Nowadays, the orthodoxy is that universities are a burden, or in any case, most universities are a burden. They are too fragmented, they are too nation-centric. At a time when economic integration at a planetary level must become the norm. So, the rescaling is meant to radically turn the university into a springboard for global markets in an economy that is increasingly innovation-based and therefore requires specialized knowledges in areas such as advanced mathematics, uh, complex systems and technologies, and so forth and so on. Thus, to a large extent, the, uh, the move towards denationalization and transnationalization, as well as uh, increased uh, teaching and research offshore. The uh, establishment of multiple franchises, especially in the, the, the Gulf states, in China, a little bit in, in Africa, in a global market that, uh, uh, in which circulates billions of dollars every single year. So it seems to me that the neoliberal argument is deployed for good reasons. I won't go into that. These are things we all know about. One consequence of this process of denationalization and transnationalization, one of the consequences has been, for instance, the defunding of major public universities, especially in the West. Another consequence has been the brutality of the competition going on between universities. Most universities are competing against each other today more than ever before for parts, shares of this global market. The um, brutality of the competition itself, it seems to me, has paved the way for a new era, we would say, of global apartheid in higher education. Global apartheid in the sense that um, winners graduate to status of world-class universities, and the rest is composed of Bush universities, churning uh, out masses of semi-qualified students most of whom are saddled with massive debts. So the question of student debt has become a major issue of our times. And an important political uh, reason why a number of forms of resistances are, are emerging in, in a number of places. So from whatever angle we want to look at it, 
the recourse to the category of neoliberalism is, is justified. Now, this having been said, I nevertheless wonder to what extent our diagnosis could be flexible enough to accommodate a diversity of historical trajectories, not all of which can be subsumed under the rubric of neoliberalism. Um, in fact, but here I'm stepping into very dangerous territory, but I'll go there in any case. In fact, a major problem of with uh, quote unquote northern theories of neoliberalism is that they hardly take into account the colonial genealogies of neoliberalism. I haven't read, I haven't found as I speak any <laughs> theory of neoliberalism coming from the global north or for that matter from the so-called global south that takes seriously the colonial origins of neoliberalism. And yet, I mean, we do have plenty of historical studies that could help precisely to re-articulate uh, such theories. Neoliberalism is not the regime that comes after liberalism. It's not at all. In fact, it is the regime which is experimented with in the colonies precisely at the moment when in the metropole a whole array of social struggles make it costly to implement it at the center. We could expand that argument and look at what's going on in Greece. It happened in Africa under the rubric of structural adjustment programs in the early 80s and the second, the last quarter of the 20th century. Here again, like in many other instances, the quote-unquote periphery has been a space of the laboratory of forms which ended up migrating back to the center. So that's the intellectual, let's say, proviso one might want to put in so far as the neoliberal argument is, is concerned. But another, the same critique can be made of another category that has been called upon to account for the state of the university today uh, in parts of Africa, South Africa in particular, uh, Latin America or even Asia is the category of decolonization. You see, I do not believe that the university in Africa is nothing but a colonial institution. It's simply not true. Factually, it is not true. I don't need to go to Timbuktu, for those of you who have heard that beautiful name. I don't need to go to Muslim universities before the advent of colonialism in the continent, Al Zituna in Tunis in 1734, Al Karawin in Fez, Morocco, 1859, before Bologna, by the way or Al-Azhar in Cairo, for that matter. I don't need to go there. And in fact, only a few institutions, in edu uh, university institutions in Africa were strictly speaking of colonial origin. The reality is that most had been established in the aftermath of decolonization by the newly independent states. They were usually regional institutions, Makerere, uh, 
Ibadan, Dakar, Lovaniyom in Kinshasa, Dar es Salaam. So, so to some extent, the so-called African University is as much a Western, quote-unquote, colonial institution as it is an internal product of the state-making process in the aftermath of colonialism. So, to write its history in Africa is to a large extent to write the history of decol the decolonized state's attempt at colonizing society in the aftermath of colonialism. And this is a major change of perspective, what I have just said. What I have just said helps us to turn upside down the decolonization project, which is premised on the false idea that the university in the continent is a Western colonial institution. I am saying that it is part of the history of the state, decolonized state's attempt at colonizing society in the aftermath of decolonization. That's what it is. So, so what happened, I'm sorry to insist on this, but it seems to me absolutely crucial for a global debate on the, how we can reimagine the university. What happens in Africa in the aftermath of decolonization, there are two things that happen which are absolutely crucial for our discussion. One is the crystallization of colonial partition, which make it such that we are a continent with 54 states. Assume that each state has more or less three, four neighbors, so four national boundaries, you multiply it by 54, and you end up, of course, with a continent that it looks like more and more like an open-air prison. Doubly penalized because nobody wants Africans anywhere. I don't know of any country where they are welcomed. If you know of any, uh, let me know. I'll relay the information. There's none. But nor are they free to move from within the continent. So double penalization, which affects not only spatial mobility, but also the mobility of ideas. And you end up with a continent with intellectual enclaves, Anglophones who cannot read anything except in English, Francophones who are striving to speak English in pidgin, Lusophones completely left out of the, the map. So you have that. And the second thing that happens after decolonization is the descent into authoritarianism, which means that decolonization in this case doesn't lead to democracy. There's a distinction between decolonization and democracy. The two in this case do not go together descent into authoritarianism, either in its civilian or military versions, or to be specific, the paramilitarization of the civilian realm and the civilization of the military domain. If you want to summarize in one formula, the kind of political order that creates this kind of university. I have gone uh, to some extent into that in order to complicate a bit more our understanding of the nature of the beast we are trying to, to reform. If we really want to create a different university, we have to start by understanding what is the nature of the beast we are dealing with. And in the continent, and I'm sure in other parts of the so-called third world, it's too easy to subsume everything under the rubric of decolonization. But I'll leave it at that. Uh, 
Not before I mention that, in fact, if one wants to understand the nature of the beast we are dealing with, what happens after decolonization is that the independent state puts in place a university that is nationalized. A nationalized university which is supposed precisely to operate like a parastatal. In the first 10, 15 years, under the model of the welfare university, where everything is taken care of. When I went to, uh, I spent, I went to the university first of all in, in Cameroon and then in Paris. When I went to the university, not that long ago, I have to tell you, uh, we, we were paid. I mean, <laughs> for the first time, at the end of the month, I would go and get my pay. It's not a salary, but 25,000 francs CFA, 25,000 francs in those years. And then, transport was free. Food was subsidized. Accommodation, the same thing. So it functioned in the model of the welfare system. Things really went wrong with the fiscal uh, crisis most African states underwent in the early 80s and, and mid 80s when all of that was cut off and fees were introduced, unrest, years spent without exams, then the rise of private universities, the commodification, all of this, those who could flee left, those who couldn't were confined to live in the middle of, midst of ruins, university having been ruined uh, completely. So, so it seems to me that that is what went on. But we can, what I want to reflect on is how is it that we move from the idea of the university as a resource in a project of domination, because that's what it was, to the university as a burden, and uh, how is it that we can emerge out of that? Now, let me move on quickly with the second set of uh, comments that have to do with the other dimension, the knowledge dimension as such. What I find particularly exciting in the current moment, including in the humanities, is the rise of uh, new objects of, of knowledge. And with them, uh, new questions, avenues of inquiry, and even emerging paradigms. It's going all on all uh, around us. Debates, give you some examples, uh, current debates on new conceptions of time and agency, um, questions about the ways in which the human world should be reimagined culturally and politically in terms of its relation with the earth. Uh, Sarah mentioned that yesterday. Debates about the, uh, the end of the human condition as marked by agency. Uh, it's um, this moment of experimentation uh, we find it also in the uh, number of so called turns that are uh, going on almost every year we have one, one, one turn after, after another when it's not the new materialism turn it's the neurological turn is the Anthropocene, uh, is the ontological turn. Uh, the velocity of turns is, is quite extraordinary. Some of them are not really real turns, uh, but, but, but uh, it all attests nevertheless to the, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, creativity that is, is going on, where, uh, uh, which itself testifies to the fact that uh, new problems are fast overtaking us that demand attention uh, and urgent experimentation. 
evidence of all of this is also uh, going on in, uh, in the advent of uh, algorithmic thinking, various forms of automated reason, uh, automation of reason casting, as we, we can see, a shadow on uh, deductive reason. And I would say on the fundamentals of uh, axiomatic truth, or on the uniqueness, in any case, of human reasoning. Uh, we see the same uh, effervescence in what is going on in terms of the ontology of numbers. Um, numbers becoming more and more uh, the engines, uh, not only of calculation, as we have been arguing since uh, the day before yesterday, but also invention and speculation. Uh, that calculation uh, nowadays is inseparable to a large extent from imagination. It's not as if one was uh, in one highway and the other in another. In fact, because of the advent of computation, calculation and imagination are more and more intertwined. Speculation too. So I could give you all kinds of examples showing the extent to which things are bubbling. Now, and I'm now moving towards the end of my presentation. What is it that this experimentation is the sign of? And to what extent is it that we can reimagine a different university or different humanities if we were to take seriously that which is, 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 is emerging? I think we have witnessed over, let's say, from the 80s on, the, uh, the emergence of two epistemological projects I would just like to touch upon, each of which gestures towards a different kind of possible university. We have an epistemological project that has risen on the back of the intensification of the critique of foundational assumptions of so-called Western thought. That especially since the middle of the 20, 20th century, the critique of some of the foundational assumptions of so-called Western thought, that critique has intensified. And that critique is not yet over. What are some of those fundamental assumptions that are on trial, that have been on trial? For instance, the idea that nature is fixed and measurable. That idea is deeply contested as I speak. The idea that material objects act only when acted upon by an external agent. Nobody believes in that, in, I mean nobody. Most people don't believe in that any longer. And yet, for at least a century, we have produced knowledge on that basis. The idea that human beings have a separate existence from the world is no longer accepted, at least in some quarters, as the basis for the production of knowledge. Or even the idea that human beings are the masters of the universe. Of course, some still believe in that, but that too is... Uh, uh, under, under pressure, to say the least. 
So we have witnessed that and that critique is intensifying. We have also witnessed in particular a critique of those assumptions that have enabled binary oppositions such as nature, culture, same, other, human, non-human, mind, matter, conscious and conscious. There are some among us who have helped <laughs> to go after those, those binaries and go after the ontological grounds on which such distinctions have been made or continue to be made uh, nowadays. And then, of late, I should add to that various attempts at rethinking the human. We spoke about some of them yesterday. Rethinking the human in the sense of moving beyond this category. Moving beyond the human in a gesture of decentering the human in a gesture of replacing the human within a broader history of forms of life or of living entities. All of which, of course, raises all kinds of questions because some people are asking, but why should we be moving beyond the human when many are still fighting to be recognized as human? So, so all of this is coming with all kinds of interrogations. But what strikes me is the attempt at changing our perspective on, on the human and its boundaries, uh, which is going on at a moment when there's a growing uncertainty about what will happen to the human species, partly because of uh, environmental disaster that humanity has created and may not be able to overcome unless we make substantial changes to our capitalist life form. So the question then is that all of this has left us with a conundrum, especially in the social sciences and the humanities. How do we extend our theoretical, methodological, and conceptual imagination. What does critique consist of? What interpretive categories might make sense of the world today, of human societies, within a trajectory of time that encompasses planetary time? So it seems to me there have been two kinds of responses to this absolutely fundamental challenge, two responses that gesture towards different types of universities. You have had one kind of response that aims at taking seriously the planetary. The planet being understood here as more than the notion of the globe or the notion of the world, which the notion of the globe, which as we know, refers to the human dominated surface of, of the earth. But as we know, the, the earth is more than the globe and more than the global environment. What many understand by the planetary Let's say the planetary aims at capturing the co-evolution of the natural and social worlds and the deep historical time of human and planetary life. So you have had one attempt. It's still not articulated as such, but it seems to me that we can articulate it around the concept of the planetary, which suggests if we push our thinking forward, a different kind of university. Then, there's a second kind of imagination which 
in which the belief is that critique consists in resisting unified accounts of the human. That it consists in situating people and social groups in the rich patterns of historical diversity that make them into who uh, they are. And uh, you have this second kind of response which aims at uh, reasserting conventional categories such as class, race, gender in the belief that they better help to reach the ultimate goal of critique which is to document and render visible the marked differences in vulnerability that divide the anthropos. So, so the project in this second case is to resist the inclination to frame humanity as an undifferentiated whole. It seems to me that that is the crossroad we find ourselves in. And that each of these possible avenues gesture towards different kinds of universities, a planetary university on the one hand, or a university in which uh, critique basically consists in documenting the uneven power relations that divide the Anthropos. I'll end it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>